Hello everybody, welcome to Waves Lesson 9. This lesson is about ultraviolet rays, x-rays and gamma rays. We start as we always do with a little mini test. A few questions about stuff that we've completed in this unit. Pause the video. And let's see how you've got on. What type of electromagnetic waves has the lowest frequency? That would be the radio end of the spectrum. What type of wave carries TV signals? That is also radio waves. What type of waves do mobile phones use? They use microwaves. What type of wave does a thermal imaging camera use? Well, a thermal imaging camera detects infrared. What type of wave will damage your eyes if it is too bright? I'm thinking of light, particularly if you look at something really, really, really bright like the sun. You got those right? Well done. So this is where we're at. Previous lessons, we would have copied out this table and we would have filled in the first four types of wave. If you can't find the table that you've already started filling in, then when we get to fill in the ultraviolet part of the table, you might need to go back and also add radio, microwave, infrared and light. But worry about that when we get to the correct part of the lesson to do it. Ultraviolet, sometimes called UV waves. Um, it's a bit like light, it's just slightly higher frequency and energy. So we can't see them. It's sort of like violet light, but a little bit higher frequency. So we can't actually see them. That doesn't mean they don't exist. It doesn't mean they can't do anything. Some things, called fluorescent, absorb UV rays and give out the energy as visible light. So it will make them glow really bright colours. Um, this emergency sign here, this is uh, from my science lab here. This emergency sign absorbs UV radiation and gives it out as visible light. So under normal lights, it's quite bright. In actual fact, it still glows a little bit when the light is turned off, making it ideal for a safety sign. So I'll let you have a look at this. It won't be really, really, really bright because this is in sort of daylight, just switching the light off. But you should notice it sort of glows a little bit brighter green when the light is switched off. Let's have a look at this. There it is. Quite a little green glow for a little bit. Now you can imagine if it was pitch dark, but with the lights on, and then all of a sudden there was a power cut, those signs would glow enough for you to see where the fire extinguisher is. They often use them for exit signs as well. UV is often used to detect forgery. This video shows how UV ink is used in banknotes. Today's modern banknotes have an abundance of security features that make them increasingly difficult to counterfeit and easier than ever to identify fakes. And what's by far my favourite of these features is UV ink. Remember those invisible ink pens you used to play with as a kid? Well, they use that ink on money. So in this video, I'm going to look at some basic examples, right the way up to the creative masterpieces of 21st century banknote design. And if you enjoy it, please consider subscribing. First up, the US dollar. The older style notes, including the $1 and $2 bills, do absolutely nothing at all. But then the newer series display a single vertical stripe. It's an efficient way of keeping the cost down on a mass-produced currency and fits with their clean and classic design. And yeah, it might seem a little boring, but it's better than the Canadian dollars, which do literally nothing under UV light. Even their brand new state-of-the-art vertical note, which is probably my favourite banknote ever released, does literally nothing. Things start to get a bit more interesting with banknotes such as the pound sterling, the New Zealand dollar and the East Caribbean dollar, which all display their denomination in fluorescent numbers. Again, it's pretty basic, but it makes an efficient and effective security feature. The pound sterling in particular features this orange and yellow checkered pattern, which is really quite difficult for criminals to replicate. You'll also notice that with a lot of paper banknotes, they have these random flecks of colour scattered all over their surface. That's something they deliberately put into the paper at the pulp stage, and again, is an extra layer of protection against counterfeiters. Now here's where things get creative. Many banknotes use UV ink to highlight some particular pattern or element of their design. The Indian rupee, for instance, sees Gandhi glow, and on the reverse, the country's architecture comes to life with brilliant colour. On the South African Rand, 
Various patterns and illustrations light up, including these rock carvings by the San, the indigenous people of Southern Africa. And the Euro becomes considerably more interesting too, highlighting stars and emblems on both sides of the notes. One of my favourite juices of UV on banknotes is to illuminate animals, as seen on the new Australian dollars. The $5 sees an eastern spinebill, the $10 a cockatoo, and the $50 a black swan in flight. Similarly, the Philippine peso features an array of ultraviolet animals, such as a palm civet, a tarsia, and a blue-naped parrot. The Norwegian crone also features a native animal, the Atlantic puffin. And finally, we get to the really elaborate banknotes. The Mexican peso is one of my favorites. It highlights various design aspects, but takes it to the extreme, creating these UV masterpieces portraying history, architecture, and nature, including the great migration of the monarch butterfly. The Swiss franc reveals a globe, with the earth rotated slightly differently on each denomination. Now, this set of banknotes still has a few yet to be released, but when complete, the currency will form a sort of UV flipbook, depicting a complete rotation of the Earth. How incredibly cool is that? I mean, Canada should really be taking notes right now. And lastly, we reach what's probably my favourite, purely for their intricate design and the sheer variation of colour used, the Hungarian forint. The 1000 sees a denomination in a vibrant rectangle encircled by flowers, as well as a raven holding a ring. The 2000 is also surrounded by a floral pattern, and features an armoured hand holding a sword, whilst the 5000 sees fluorescent gears and cogwheels, and a column of Budapest's chain bridge in orange and green ink. Ultimately, UV ink is just a security feature, with the clear and functional purpose of helping us detect fake notes. But that doesn't mean it can't be creative. Banknotes are something most people use every day, and yet without realising that in the right light, they transform into UV masterpieces. So who would have known those banknotes would look so different under UV light? Very, very difficult to forge notes because you've got not only the UV ink in there, but you've also got the normal ink. So very good for detecting forgery. Um, another video for you now, much, much shorter this time. This is um, some excerpts from a police training video for doing fingerprints. What I want you to look at here is how he uses fluorescent fingerprint powder and UV light to see fingerprints that aren't normally visible. Hi, welcome back to Forensic Education. I'm Mike McCutcheon. Today we're going to cover two topics. I'm going to teach you how to use fluorescent fingerprint powder and we're also going to use fluorescent light sources or alternative light sources to locate evidence. Now here's our fingerprint that we used and this is with the naked eye without using any alternative light. Now it's pretty bright and you can see some ridges but once we light it up you see how much more brilliant the colors are they stand right out and you can see the ridge details. You would lift this print just as you would any other print. Now here's another piece that I did a little bit earlier and again, if you look at it without any light, with the naked eye, I can't see any fingerprint on here at all. I'm going to use my battle light, and I contaminated it with the orange. But you can see a fingerprint in there as well. Now this one will be a little more difficult to see because it's we're on a white background, but again, you can't see the fingerprints. Once we put our alternative light on it, you're going to see right here is a nice fingerprint. So then, in crime scene detection, what they do is they use some kind of fluorescent fingerprint powder to dust for prints. Now, you wouldn't necessarily see those fingerprints, but when you put UV light on it, where there's some sort of ridges of grime, that fluorescent powder sticks and it glows really brightly and it helps you find the fingerprints. That's why you see them all going around with UV lights on CSI, and CSI in Miami, etc., etc. UV is a type of ionizing radiation. You remember from previous units that an atom has a nucleus in the middle 
with shells of electrons around the outside. Now, normally, a normal atom is electrically neutral. It has the same number of pluses and minus charges. This one here, for example, is carbon. Now, it will have six protons, six plus charges. The other two, I guess, are hidden the other side in the nucleus. Six neutrons, you can see five of them. Remember, it's like a cluster or a ball. And it should have one, two, three, four, five, six electrons around the outside. But this ionizing radiation that's come in, this ultraviolet light that's come in, has managed to knock one of the electrons off its outer shell. So this now becomes charged. This is actually got more plus charges than it has minus charges. The energy of the wave removes outer shell electrons, making the atoms charged or ionized. Now, ultraviolet waves can ionize atoms in the cells of your skin, causing damage, which can lead to skin cancer. Now, this thing over here, this is a sunbed. Your skin produces suntan. It goes slightly browner in color to try and protect you. Too much suntan will damage your skin. Sunscreen is designed to protect you from UV rays. So if you actually look on your uh, bottle of sunscreen, it will say, um, it will give you an indication, it will give you a number on there of how much UV protection it gives you. And the reason it's trying to give you UV protection is because your skin will be damaged if it receives too many UV rays. The other picture over here, this sunburn is damaged skin. And remember, too much damage can lead to skin cancer. So it is really a bad idea to go out in the sun and let your skin get tanned that much. Really, really bad. You are putting yourself at risk, very high risk of getting skin cancer. Um, the Daz effect. Now, Daz is a washing powder. Um, there was an advert on TV a few years back saying, all oh, this lovely bluey whiteness. Well, how does Daz work? Well, it's got some chemicals in it that when you wash your clothes in Daz are slightly fluorescent and they give off a sort of bluish glow. So you get your perfectly normal white shirt and you wash it in Daz washing powder and you get it out and it all dries. And there's a little bit of residue of this fluorescent chemical in your shirt and you go out in the sun and the sun shines on that and it causes the the shirt to glow slightly bluey white when you look at it you think oh that's very very bright white in actual fact it's not so much the shirt is very very bright white is the shirt is slightly glowing so the uv rays from the sun are being absorbed by the shirt and they'll be given out at the very sort of blue end of the spectrum the shirt doesn't look blue it looks just a very very bright white there are various toothpastes that do the very similar thing as well. You clean your teeth, your teeth look white in normal light. Get out in the sun, give it a lovely smile, and your teeth look really bright, bluey white. Not really blue, but really nice, clear white. And the reason it looks nice, clear white is because there's some fluorescent chemicals in that toothpaste. There's a little bit of it residue on the surface of your teeth and the UV rays from the sun hit those, those chemicals and they give out that lovely bluey white colour. Your teeth look lovely and white and shiny. Everybody's really, really impressed. That's the Daz effect. So we need to record that information in your table then. So dig out your table. This new stuff I've put in red. Pause the video. Let's look at x-rays. X-rays will travel through soft tissue. So it will pretty much travel quite easily through skin and muscle and any type of flesh, but it gets stopped by hard tissue. And that's really mostly your bones. Also, it gets stopped if you've got rings and other, you know, bits of metal splinters stuck in your skin, things like that. They all show up on x-rays. Um, X-rays cause photographic film to be developed. Now, if you put your photographic film in a black sealed envelope, then no light can get to it. But the X-rays will penetrate through that envelope and cause um, the film to be developed. If you put your hand in front of that piece of photographic film in the envelope and shine X-rays through it, 
so the x-rays have to go through your hand before they get to the film then obviously the skin and muscle will let pretty much all the x-rays through the bones will stop it and it'll get developed in different places much like this diagram at the bottom here's your x-ray machine it shines x-rays through your hand your hand will stop the x-rays where your bones are but it will let most of the x-rays through when your skin and muscle is and all of them will go through in the gaps between your fingers if your hand is in front of some kind of photographic film sealed of course in a brown envelope or something a sealed envelope then you get some kind of x-ray pattern so you can see here these are the bones this is where the x-rays haven't been able to get through and develop the photographic film this is the fleshy bit of your body around here you can see the outline of your hand that's where the x-rays pretty much have been able to get through quite easily but not completely as well as over here where there's nothing in its way x-rays are also ionizing radiation they can ionize your cells if they're copying it will lead to mutations and it can lead to various forms of cancer um, but it really really is all about the dose i've had x-rays before when i've been in car accidents or gone to the dentist a few little x-rays are not going to cause you any harm but if you're operating an x-ray machine all day if you're a radiologist or something um all those hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of x-rays that you take each day um put you at a very 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 high risk so this would be the radiologist here and should be standing behind some kind of screen which is probably lead lines to prevent any x-rays going through so she's safe and you're safe because you're getting a very 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 low dose let's add x-rays to your table then i've put it up in red copy that down pause the video Let's have a look at gamma rays. They're produced by radioactive sources. So let's give you an example here. This is um, the, one of the gamma ray sources we've got in school. So that was gamma radiation, gamma rays, and produced by radioactive sources, they will pass through the human body and other objects, but they are ionizing radiation. They will actually kill living tissue, but sometimes we can use that to our advantage. So if you've got some food and you want to get rid of some of the bacteria possibly in there, you can actually use gamma radiation to sterilize the food. Um, because it kills the pathogens and medical instruments as well. If you've got something, you don't really, if it's some kind of medical instrument, you don't really want to take it out and scrub it with boiling hot water and then dry it with a tea towel or something. That's not very good. What you can do is take that medical instrument and you can subject it to gamma rays. And what you will actually find is those gamma rays will destroy any pathogens, making it perfectly sterile to use on an operation unlikely to pass on or not going to pass on any infections there at all um yeah gamma is ionizing radiation it can damage body cells but you can use that to your advantage as well so imagine this is a person here and this circle this area here is some kind of tumor some kind of cancer of the brain now you can't really operate on that cancer because it's sort of in the middle of the brain so if you sort of start slicing the brain open you're going to cause a lot of damage it's not a sensible way forward so you can try and destroy it with gamma radiation so what you can't do is just get a gamma source and blast it everywhere because yes you're probably going to kill off the cancer but you're going to introduce loads of other um, damage to the brain in terms of new tumors and things forming that's no good so you need to be a little bit more focused what you do is you fire a very very narrow beam of gamma rays into the head remember we said gamma rays will basically pass through the human body it can there's a small chance it's going to cause a little bit of damage as it goes through but the risk is very low unless you keep doing it all the time well this cancer's had one dose and this part of the body here's had one dose 
And the clever thing is you start moving the machine around. So the cancer now is on its second dose, but this part of the brain is still on its first dose because it's in a different place. And as you move it around, the cancer is now getting three doses. This part of the brain is only getting one dose. Move it around again, cancer is getting four doses. This, the rest of the head, the rest of the brain is still on its first dose. Once again, fifth dose for the cancer, the rest of the head is only getting one dose. One dose is unlikely to cause any harm, you see. And as you keep moving it around, the cancer is the only bit that keeps getting hit. The radiation is, the rest of the head is only sort of like getting one dose. It's passing through different parts of the head at a time. And that's how they can use gamma radiation to try and kill cancer. So the cancer gets a dose of radiation every time the machine sends a wave. The rest of the head only gets the occasional dose. It's a little bit like your x-rays thing where, you know, one or two x-rays is unlikely to cause you any harm, but hundreds and hundreds and hundreds will. And that's what we're doing here, except the thing we're tr trying to cause harm to is the cancer. That's the only bit that gets hit loads of times. So. Let's add gamma rays, last one to our table then. Fill that bit in, it's in red at the bottom. Pause the video. To finish this lesson then, a mini test, a matching exercise. You need to draw a line from the wave to the correct use and then from the correct use to the danger. Have a go at this then, pause the video. Let's see how you got on then. So microwaves are used for communication. This would be your mobile phones and they damage only in high quantity. So um, you're not going to get any, da um, any damage or any harm from microwaves unless you do something silly like put your cat in the microwave. Please don't do that. That will cause harm to your cat. Infrared. Um, used for finding bodies in earthquakes, amongst other things, and the danger is it's very hot things burn. So if something's given out loads of infrared radiation, like a red hot poker, you can burn yourself. Ultraviolet, it's great for stopping fake money. You remember those, uh, we, we looked at the banknotes and the little things glowing under UV light. And the danger is with the sunbeds, for example, or sunbathing, um, is skin cancer. So sunbeds cause skin cancer, but particularly out in the sun where there's no regulation, there's no maximum exposure time. You spend all day in the sun and you do increase your risk of getting skin cancer. X-rays is the use is looking for broken bones. Um, of course, you get mutations in cancer with it and gamma rays, sterilizing medical equipment, and again, mutations in cancer. If you've got these two boxes the other way around because it says the same thing, then you can have the marks for it. If you've got all of those things right, well done. Well, we're at the end of the unit. Anything in this lesson or any of the other lessons you're not sure of, you can go back and watch all the videos again. You can have a go at all the questions again and all the support materials again. But for now, that's all, folks. Thank you very much.